Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good, good evening, <laughs> depending on where you are connecting. Uh, this afternoon, we have the Nigeria Open uh, Forum session and uh, is on data governance and uh, trust. I, I will hand this mic over to the chairperson and um, we have the privilege and honor of having the distinguished senior uh, committee chair on ICT and uh, cybersecurity, uh, Senator Afola Bishaibo. Uh, over to you, sir, and um, you introduce yourself, and maybe you allow the speakers also to introduce themselves. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you so much, Madam. I'd like to join you as well to welcome everybody, both physically and online. Today's Nigerian Open Forum on IGF Kyoto 2023. As I've been introduced, my name is Senator Shoeba Folabi Salisu. I'm the chairman of Nigerian Senate Committee on ICT and Cybersecurity. I'm not just chairing this committee, I'm also an IT practitioner for almost close to four decades. So I'm here both as a legislator and also as a practitioner and proudly Nigerian too. So today, we'll be looking at the issue of uh, data governance and trust. And we have a panel that will do justice to this topic. We have a, an array of people from both private sector, from the regulatory organization, as well as also from the uh, legislature. Uh, to, let me just ask uh, the lead discussant and the panelists to just introduce themselves briefly, and then we'll start at the ball rolling. I'm gonna start from Dr. Bernard Ewa, please. Thank you, distinguished Senator, and um, a very uh, great welcome to everybody who has joined us today. My name is Bernard Ewa. I'm the Acting Director of E-Government Development and Regulation at the National Information Technology Development Agency. All right, thank you, the moderator, and then yeah, good afternoon or good morning to everyone watching. My name is Dr. Chidi Diugu. I'm uh, from the Nigerian Communications Commission. Thank you. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Honorable Adedeji Stanley Olajide, also rep member um, for the Nash uh, Nigerian National Assembly, the Chairman House Committee on ICT and Cybersecurity. Kumba uh, Wan Okini. Arigato. And that is saying the greetings uh, to everyone uh, listening in, in Japanese. And uh, welcome. My name is Jameson Olufuye. I have the privilege of being the chair of the Advisory Council of the Africa ICT Alliance, which is made up of about 40 countries, uh, private sector practitioner in the IT industry. I'm also the principal consultant at Contemporary Consulting, IT firm based in Abuja, Nigeria. Welcome, everybody. Yeah, thank you. And talking about being contemporary, we need to have a balanced uh, mix. Therefore, I have online Nena Nwakama. Nena Nwakama, uh, satisfiable gender, as well as online participation. We cannot be talking about the internet without having panelists on the internet. So in another place, introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear and see me. Bonjour from Abidjan. My name is Nenna. I come from the internet. Happy to be here. Thank you so much. Without much ado, <coughs> Uh, and the run program, the run of the programs, we're going to have the late uh, presenter, uh, Dr. Benadia, who is who's going to do justice for some 10 minutes, and thereafter, we're going to have our panelists who make their interventions very few minutes so that we can have some time for the uh, audience. So, at this point in time, I must also recognize that uh, uh, part of the crew for this program, uh, we have um, uh, Kunle Olondari who is the online moderator, is also somewhere here, is the acting president of Internet Society Nigeria chapter. So, without much ado, Dr. Bennett Awa, you have 10 minutes to lead us through the issue of data governance and trust. How far so far in Nigeria? Your time starts counting now. 
Thank you very much. I hope I can I can leave with the ten minutes. Okay. Can you put on this slide? Um, in the last couple of days, uh, we've there's a lot has been spoken about uh, inter, uh, data governance and trust. Um, uh, for us now, we're going to try to mirror that in the perspective of uh, Nigeria, you know, the journey we've taken and uh, where we, uh, we hoped to to navigate so in the, in the next uh, a, f a few years. And the discussion on, on data governance uh, and trust in Nigeria, um, we are approaching it from two uh, dimensions. Um, of course, the commoditization of data has uh, given um, uh, the need for countries to um, uh, uh, um, derive value from, from data, at the same time protecting um, data subjects. At the same time providing uh, data subjects. So, um, however, in the last uh, uh, few years, this uh, issue has continued to be even more uh, uh, complex because we are seeing discoveries of uh, new uh, data uh, sources. And um, we are also seeing um, data increasingly being you know, uh, uh, owned or by, uh, residing in multiple residences, you know, having you know, multiple owners, and also the, the subject um, dwelling across multiple uh, legal jurisdictions. You know, so for regulators, we have to be aware of uh, this changing dynamics. Um, and more importantly, um, the fact that data has become you know, a, a highly sought after commodity, it means that there are more and more capabilities for its reuse by, by parties. So these are some of the challenges that reg uh, regulatory in, uh, authorities are dealing with. And as I said at the beginning, the cri uh, critical is uh, issue focus here is how to create that balance between um, extraction of value and protection of data subjects. In, along the line uh, of uh, this, uh, the challenges which uh, I mentioned earlier on, of course, is the issue of uh, um, a broad set, uh, the need for a broad set of uh, data, uh, data governance st structures that uh, d uh, recognize the increasing uh, dynamics of data it, it, it itself. Um, a few years ago, or a decade or so ago, it was common for us to focus on the particular known organized structured set of data, but that is not uh, uh, the case to, uh, today. We are also seeing data that is uh, increasingly being integrated, um, so a mix of structured and unstructured data. Uh, uh, while we, we continue to, to, to uh, discover and, and, and new data sources, okay, so. That calls for a lot of uh, um, new needs for you know, infrastructure, storage. Um, there's also the, um, the challenge of, of, of filtering you know, good data from, from bad data. In, in the last few years, we've also seen uh, the occurrence of uh, um, fake news uh, and how to deal with that. So all of these are challenges for regulatory organizations. You know. However, in the midst of this, there are lots of opportunities uh, for, for all stakeholders. As I said uh, earlier on, the key is balancing or having a, a healthy balance between the commod commodification of data you know, and uh, uh, protection, right? And that's essentially the, the, the fine line that regulatory uh, authorities in Nigeria have been, have been treading uh, so that uh, the re regulations are not to stifle development or growth, but at the same time ensure that it give ample opportunities for uh, uh, for stakeholders, particularly the private sector and other interest groups, you know, to to, to use data, you know, to, to, to grow the economy. So what we've seen in terms of data governance is you know, a, a move towards uh, a re a regulatory inst instruments that are market facing, right? um, instruments that uh, begin to recognize that, yes, innovation has to 
you know, uh, the both sides on the price side of of of, of uh, regulation, as just as we expe expect these regulations to also instigate innovation in the in the market, right? And create new product or uh, provide opportunities for private sector led uh, uh, investments that create new new uh, uh, provisions for new services. Um, Importantly, in, 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 the, in the mix of all of these is uh, for regulations to um, create avenues for a private sector to uh, invest in new digital infrastructures. And data is, itself is, is one of those potent uh, um, infrastructures. And that is the, the focus of the governance uh, uh, processes that um, regulatory organizations are focusing on. And lastly, the idea is to ensure that uh, data can be used effectively to you know, accelerate attainments of sustainable development uh, goals. In Nigeria, we have taken very uh, uh, concrete and laudable steps uh, beginning with the creation of a dedicated organization for data protection. You know, and passage of a, of a, of a, uh, of a bill you know, that uh, promotes the, uh, the protection of uh, data subjects and, and, their, and their privacy and provides clear uh, 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 instruments for uh, compliance and, and punishments of, uh, of the defenders, offenders. We've also uh, uh, passed the code of Con uh, practice uh, for interactive computer uh, services and platforms. Uh, just before this uh, session started, we were, we were having an, an informal interaction with, with colleagues here from, from Ghana, uh, from Kenya, who you know, sp sp spoke very favorably about uh, Nigeria's code of, of, of practice. You know, and that's an example of how um, governance instruments can be used to enhance trust in the, in, in, in the, in, in the society, and allow uh, participants uh, and other stakeholders to play by the by fair uh, 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 rules of the game. Now, as I um, mentioned at the beginning, uh, governance has to be uh, driven in such a way that they have clear you know, outcomes, outcomes that leads to you know, positive changes in the um, in, in the economy. So that means that begins with you know, building a strong knowledge base, you know, uh, for uh, both practitioners uh, uh, as well as users of, of, of data. You know, you know, creating uh, necessary and you know forward-looking uh, policies that catalyze investments and, and development in the use of data for as, as a resource for, for development. You know, providing uh, g uh, digital platforms or p public infrastructure such uh, as, uh, platforms that allow for the reuse of data to extend the ideals of open government, open data, you know, are some of these uh, you know, uh, areas that um, uh, data governance uh, approach is seeking to achieve. Of course, I talked about infrastructure and the, the, the needs to uh, allow um, governance to enhance innovation, you know, allow the innovation ecosystem to tap on the potentials uh, created by data to, to create uh, the new products and services that strengthen the, 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 the economy. Lastly, provide supporting trade from uh, innovations. So in conclusion, uh, I hope I'm within the, the 10 minutes uh, mark. In, yeah. in conclusion, um, key to enhancing um, the, the use of, of data uh, is the, the, the need for us to strengthen the capacity of various actors in the, in, in the system, right? Continue to create awareness among users, you know, promote engagement across levels of government, you know, 
um, across other uh, user communities who stand to benefit from, from data. An example is you know, traditional, statistical organizations like the National Bureau of Statistics in Nigeria, the Population Commission, right? So the availability of new data sources and the potentials and, uh, you know, that they uh, uh, come with to strengthen existing practices, you know, has to be uh, followed up with eff effective engagements with, with those partners and Build, building capacity across layers of governments from national to subnational. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ewa. Yeah, yeah, you are free to clap, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Ewa. And I think the important thing you have said to us is that Nigeria has progressed in terms of data governance and trust. We used to have a data bureau. Now we have a, an act that has established a national data uh, protection commission, including the code of conduct, uh, meaning that we now have a legal framework. But one thing is to have a legal framework, and then I'm coming to you now. One thing is to have a legal framework from the civil society perspective. What more do you think we need to do to enhance transparency uh, in terms of data acquisition, particularly by citizens, the, the, the right of consent? Do you think what we have are sufficient now, or what are those new elements that we, you think we need to introduce to ensure that the data collection, data acquisition uh, from the civil society perspective uh, is respected. In and out, your two minutes start from now. In and out, bonjour. In and out. Hello. Okay. Yes. Did you ask? Okay. Did you get my question? No. Can you repeat? It's raining here and the own sound is low, but please go ahead. Okay. Dr. Ewa has spoken extensively about some of the framework that have been put in place by the Nigerian government, including the establishment of Nigerian Data Protection Commission at the Code of Conduct yes. and non, a number of some of these uh, issues. But from the citizen's perspective, from the civil society perspective, one thing to have this framework, what more do you think we need to do to enhance transparency, accountability in data acquisition including the right of citizens uh, to decline or consent uh, to the acquisition of their data? Okay, so um, this is a Nigerian forum. And were it not that this was an international forum, I would have switched to Pidgin English. But I think I will speak proper English. I'll get the AI to translate. For accountability purposes. <laughs> So the, the first thing is, I love the presentation because it took the angle of regulation that encourages innovation. Because in most cases, when we talk about regulation, we are talking about imposing the law, we are talking about stifling, we are talking about um, fining people and all of that, basically scaring them away. What our parents do at home, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. But then what should we be doing? No, no one tells us. <clears throat> but I love this because we're looking at uh, regulation for innovation. That's my first submission. My second submission is that as Nigerians, we used to we think that we are big, we are populous and all of that. But I, I don't think in the case of data governance, that really matters a lot. It is in the creating the use, the reusing of data, that value is added, not in the population of a country, okay? So I really want to put that across. It's not enough to say we are over 200 whatever million. That, that doesn't make any economic sense. What makes economic sense is that when the dollars come in, especially now that dollars are rare in Nigeria. So one is the creation for uh, regulating for innovation, um, value in the data itself for poverty reduction, for development, and for wealth creation. That is what is of importance to me. Now, um, governance of data cannot happen in a silo. I see a lot of brothers and sisters here. We are Nigerians, and we know how governance is in Nigeria. I don't think that the data governance in Nigeria will far exceed the general governance in Nigeria. And I'm saying this because we have senators, we have governors, we have 
people in authority in this room. So my, my, my feeling is that the data governance in Nigeria will not supersede the general governance that we have in terms of other things, the social, uh, political uh, situation in Nigeria. Now, flows follow flows. I, and I really want to uh, put some energy on this. As citizens, which data are, do we have access to? Which data are we creating? Which data is being valued? Uh, I mean, I'm from Aba, I support Enyimba, but then uh, the, much of the data I will create will be on the European Champions League or the, the English, English uh, League, because that is where much of the talk is going. So earlier in the week, I was talking about uh, data as, as in travel. There are hubs, there are important things. And the question is, are we creating the data? Are we availing the data that will be used, reused to make to, for value purposes? I know I only have two minutes. Let me end with data dialogues. We, we talked about trust. Um, having that continued discussion, I'm happy that at least Nigeria has a framework. Nigeria has an agency. We know the who, the what, the how, and the why. Congratulations to Nigeria. Now the continued dialogue among partners, citizens, private sector is what will create that trust. We are not there yet, but we are in the right direction. And I'm happy that we're having this conversation though it took Kyoto to bring us together, but I hope that after this, we can continue conversation at home so that we can operationalize what we have and make it better. And once again, uh, data for us, for me as a citizen, is for me to feel safe, but it's, for, it's also for me to make money and be a better Nigerian. I'll stop so far. Thank you so much, Nena. Uh, you can give Nena a virtual clap if you like. Uh, <laughs> One thing she said that came very strongly uh, through for me was how do we derive value from data? And when it comes to economic engagement, the private sector is best suited uh, to pursue it. Dr. James Olufu, you have been in this space for quite some time and you're into, into private sector. We have a population of 220 million people, 70% of them are youth, they generate data now. What are the opportunities? How will the private sector tap into these opportunities to turn this data into naira and cobo, into yen and into dollars? Yeah, very outstanding uh, question because uh, uh, money uh, is important. Creating, creation of wealth, uh, boosting income, and GDP is very, very key. Uh, I'll be speaking, of course, from the private sector perspective, and. Uh, I would like to do a little introduction in regard to how this IGF came about. For many that are listening to us, that may not know much about IGF itself. Uh, IGF is one of the two tracks of uh, activities from uh, the Tunis agenda of the World Summit of Information Society in 2005. Uh, Internet Governance Forum is a track, Enhanced Cooperation is another track. And uh, it was really clearly stated that all stakeholders must be involved in this. All stakeholders, uh, the government, the private sector, the civil society, the academic and the technical community must all be involved. So as private sector, we have uh, uh, AFICTA for Africa, basically. And as I mentioned, Africa City Alliance, the vision is to fulfill the promise of the digital age for everybody in Africa through advocacy, and we've been relating with many uh, governments like Egypt, of course, Nigeria, through NCC, NIDA, uh, very proactive uh, in that regard. So from the private sector perspective, there's a lot of value to be uh, derived in data. And uh, when you talk about data, of course, talking about the internet, so the internet penetration is quite high, and we commend the the, the government for putting proactive uh, policy framework in place, and uh, of course the acts, uh, necessary acts for data governance, as uh, Dr. Uh, Ewa mentioned. So with this uh, framework in place, we could really achieve a lot. Uh, not too long ago, uh, I did a research uh, for an international organization, and that used the data available, open data. World Bank open data. 
So we also use uh, data from NCC available on the website. Uh, Nigeria belongs to the Open Government Partnership. So data need to be released, be made available. In fact, data, you get more wealth. Uh, I, I saw something on social media. Somebody said, uh, in 2023, Nigeria has become poorer you know, than it was in 1980. And so we are at the same level. I look at the data, I said, this is not true. Because in 1980, our GDP per capita was just $800. And 2023, our GDP per capita is times three of that, about $2,500. And Nigeria is the number one economy in Nigeria, in, in Africa. And that is because we rebase the economy, we can see the impact of data, the impact of uh, the internet in boosting the GDP. And we have not gotten to the society. We've not gotten to our optimal position because our optimal position should be in the range of $1.5 trillion. So data has a lot of value to add and again commend the government with the structure you know, that is in place. Now, there is a measure or an item of that act and that talks to localization of data. That policy encourages the building of more data centers. In fact, my company, we do that. We do consultation for, uh, if you want to build data center, we do that. Cyber security, we do that you know, as well. Uh, then- I will charge you for advert. On local- can continue, I'll charge you for advert. But, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, these are the benefits. You say I should bring the value, so I'm <laughs> talking about the value. Now, now, we know we have companies like Jumia, e, like Conga, you know, eTransat. These are companies that deal with cross-border data. And cross-border data, it's important we look at it. The government need to look at that. And then uh, put in framework to ensure that if there are issues with data, even in, uh, say in Ghana, in Kenya, we can resolve those issues, especially for with regard to uh, prosecution, okay? law enforcement. Okay? And then we have banks all over Africa. We need to encourage them to move to Europe, to Africa. So they, we need to, therefore, be involved in endorsing, uh, for example, the African Union Convention on the Cyber Security and Data Protection. So with that, we have a framework to relate with other countries. So these are international values that we could also create. And uh, of course, we have our CCTLD, okay, uh, with our NERA being our registry. So that uh, CCTLD needs to be signed. Because once it's signed, there'll be more trust, because we are talking about data governance and trust. There'll be more trust, so DNSSEC needs to be signed. We are looking forward to that. And with that, we'll see many of our banks, they are, will be domiciling their CCTLD, the country called top-level domain. They'll be domiciling it in Nigeria. So those are measures that are created. But we're making progress, no, no doubt about that. Okay? And uh, we, it needs to be sustained. And that's why I appreciate the organizer of this event, this forum at the international level, to project what the progress Nigeria has been making and also to see uh, the other things we need to do. Uh, also to thank in the National Assembly for being proactive. So uh, I appreciate you, uh, the uh, Senate uh, uh, Committee here on ICT and House, to be in here. This is the first time we will have you, uh, the, uh, at least lawmaker of this category of this level here. Because I've been involved in IGF for a long while as a private sector entity. And indeed, really, this is the first time. So we want, we, it's a time to look forward to more breakthrough with regard to data governance and trust in Nigeria. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <clears throat> private sector can smell money. Uh, I have told us that there's money to be made. Um, and, and of course, particularly because we have large database now that we need to begin to exploit and exploit it for financial uh, our benefit and to also grow the economy. Dr. Uh, Judy, I'm going to come to you now uh, from NCC. Right, we have Data Protection Commission in place. We have a number of framework. And somebody, some people will say, our problem is not about initiatives, it's about finishatives, finishing what we initiate. Now that we have all of this framework in place, what do we need to do to ensure, or rather, from the regulatory perspective, what we organization and other organizations in this space do to ensure that the implementation monitoring uh, of all of these frameworks produce the desired uh, outcome so that we can begin to have initiatives? I hope my two minutes hasn't started. <laughs> Thank you very much, distinguished senator of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. I was actually going to start on a different note, but um, uh, I was a little bit um, 
interested in, in what Nena was talking about. And so uh, as a regulator, I think it's important that I address it. But before then, I thank the lead presenter for his very beautiful job. There's a known correlation between population size and market size. So telecommunication success rate is defined by the size of the market. In Nigeria, as far back as six months ago, we had over 226 million subscribers. And then talking about data is basically what you get off the internet. And then we, had, we have about 156 million Nigerians using the internet. Out of this, about 92 million have broadband connectivity. So in telecommunications, the compounded annual growth rate is you know, ranging anything between 12 to 14% 14, uh, 14% every year. And then we're also compacting other industries like the, the, the manufacturing and then the financial services, growing you know, the fintech market you know, every day. You can stay at, uh, at home now and then generate enough revenue. And there are many data sources. But that's not the subject of today. I think the subject is more or less to talk about data. And then what we should be aiming our big guns at? What is data? There must be clarity. Data in itself could, can mean nothing, but I think the question would have been metadata. You know, metadata is a structured you know, information, if you like, contextual information about data. And for us as regulators, that's what we're interested in. Now, let me define metadata further using a lot of applications. If you are using a mobile phone device, what are you doing? You, the, your phone is able to mainstream your phone number, your location, your geophysical, whatever it is, the steps you take, and so on and so forth. And then if you have many applications, even it can go as far as talking about your heartbeat and so on and so forth. And then if you are using the email, the email is able to profile how you stay on the email, how you respond to email, whom you are responding to, the time it took you to respond, the messages that you read and those that you do not read. These are metadata. And somebody somewhere is profiling this thing in the name of artificial intelligence. And these are major source of revenues. So if we begin to talk about people that are browsing, OK, fine, you are browsing about going to London, to, you, to wherever it is. But the moment you click on the internet, your information is being you know, um, generated. And then, and then somehow, on that sort of compelling means, you could be told that if you do not click yes, you cannot have access to further information. So metadata is you know, very disruptive, and then we must address it as regulators. Now, the NDPR, you know, which essentially is a Nigerian response to how data is being used, is very effective and very commendable. However, we need to know that the battlefield is not you know, at the national level only. Metadata travels with the speed of light. And then you can never talk, you can know the source because it comes from the data subject. And that could be, as far as you know, data transit and then there's a destination. So what, where, to what extent and to what speed do your data travel? These are very big questions that we answer as regulators. Now, I'll give you an instance. The NDPR is somehow localized, talking about how you behave in the marketplace in Nigeria to make Nigeria a corporate you know, responsible trader. That is fine. But what do you say to users whose data has traveled as far as to the United States of America or to China, all in the name of uh, cookies and stuff like that? So these are the source of revenues that never get to be relocated to Nigeria. And then we must have to begin to talk about cross-border collaborations to understand to what extent data travel, and to what extent our information is going to be used to shape the future of mankind. We have talking about algorithms, you know, displaying artificial intelligence, studying how human beings behave. They are very fine and good. But at a very convenient level, all we say is that the consumer has the right to choose what information they want to assess. The consumer has got the right to know whether to give out their data or not to give out their data. The consumer has got the right to say, I do not want to participate any longer. The consumer has the right to change their mind. But there is a duty of care on the part of both data um, controllers and data processors. And unfortunately, in most cases, data controllers and data processors are outside of our jurisdictions. So in the nutshell, as a regulator, what we do is that we have got a number of regulations 
a number of interventions that we use from time to time to ensure that, um, you know, like, like lawful intercept, you know, and then child online protection and then other regulatory is available at our website. You can go there and see. We have a robust uh, set regime, that is the computer security incident response team that mainstreams you know, data as they develop and then alert the constituency of telecommunications accordingly. Thank you very much. You better clap for the regulator because non-clapping can be a violation of regulation. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Chidi, for that very beautiful submission. I'm going to my brother and colleague in the House of Representatives, the chairman of uh, House Committee on ICT and Cyber Security. And uh, your question is very simple. You made the laws, National Assembly makes all the laws, including the one that governs the data protection. What rules are for National Assembly beyond making the laws to ensure that these laws are obeyed, not just by individuals, but by corporate players in the space. So I have uh, online now, um, Honorable Stanley Adediji to give us legislative intervention. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, thank you, everybody. I am Honorable Adediji Stanley Olajide. Well, let's just put this in perspective because to enact laws, there are a few things that we must understand. What are the value? I mean, this is Data is our jewel, that's the new oil. In order for us to uh, do what we do best, we have to promote laws that basically will make data usable. Data will also promote the integrity of the data. Also, in order for data to be useful, it must be consistent and secured. Because if you have data in the hands, for example, when I, let's talk about the security aspect of data, where our laws must protect. You also want to make sure that the chain of custody of data is protected in our laws. You don't want data in the hands of the wrong person. You only give people rights to data that they need, not indefinite access to the data. Then also, you have to make sure that segregation of duty is built into your data structure as well with our laws. That, and there will be clear monitoring and evaluation of all these controls because you build controls to help you achieve these things. And the laws must be very clear on how all these things are going to be achieved. And there will be very strict, the law is also going to pre provide very clear, strict rules. You break these rules, there will be sanctions, stiff sanctions for breaking these rules. So in all, in all in all, we have to legislate, understand, because data is a moving target. It's not a static thing. When you're dealing with historical data, it's different. Historical data is stat static. But when you're dealing with financial data or health records or medical records, those are more like a, they're on the move. So you always have to constantly revamp your laws to deal with the challenges of now. So if for some reason uh, there are new rules that say uh, you only give uh, your DNA structure, a certain part of it, to, to uh, the users or to the government. You only restrict that. So in, in clear language, I don't want to go into too, too much technicalities. In clear language, we have to protect our data to make them usable, flexible, secured, and make sure that this is the jewel that we are going to use to, for example, we just went through COVID-19. The amount of data that medical, I mean, uh, researchers are going to need from this COVID-19 data, are, have we protected it? So we are going to have to make sure that we have laws in place to protect that data so that we can uncover the values attached to them. So that's what we are going to be doing to make sure that our laws can guide those principles. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, and I'd like to thank my brother for that intervention. Okay. Uh, and when Dr. Chidi was talking the other time, you mentioned cross-border cooperation. And I'm also delighted to say that we have in this audience today the African Parliamentarians Network on uh, Internet Governance APNIC, led by our Secretary General, Honorable Sam George, who um, is, is from Ghana, technically, but he's actually Nigerian. Um, <laughs> Uh, he told me of Kramer that he loves Nigeria and your love mother, he loves Ghana. Um, so I'd like to welcome the members of APNIC who are here uh, from different countries. We are from, uh, uh, from Ghana, from Gambia. Thank you so much uh, uh, for coming. I also recognize in the house um, the Deputy Chief Whip of the Nigerian House of Representatives, uh, Rat Honorable uh, Adewumi Uriyomi Ononuga. I mean, thank you, uh, uh, Deputy Chief, for, for coming here. So I'm going to uh, yield ground. We have, we have some, some 90 minutes left. Uh, you know, I just think we need to take interventions from uh, audience, both online and uh, um, physically here. But you cannot be talking about data without, allowing, without hearing the voice of the youth. Uh, I'm going to turn my moderator uh, into an interventionist now. Kule uh, Olandari. You are the acting president of uh, the Internet uh, uh, Society. Uh, oh, Kole is online. Okay. Kole, if you're online. Yes, I'm here. You are here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. Yes. Now, <laughs> the, the bulk of data that has been generated is actually largely from the youth. I mean, so we can't be talking about data without hearing the voice of the youth. So for a moment, you are going to transform from being online moderator to uh, a panelist, and that's the power of the chairman. Uh, okay, so All right. can I have your perspective, the perspective of the youth, perspective of the Nigerian Internet, uh, Internet Society on this issue of data governance and privacy in Nigeria? All right, thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Um, I am very much excited to be <laughs> on this call, so to say. And first of all, let me appreciate um, our honorables who has made it a point of duty to be on this call, even not of their busy schedule. And uh, it's a good thing that uh, we are having this kind of discussion, even at an international forum. And uh, that shows that uh, we have a, a lot to do together in terms of multi-stakeholderism. And that is the right way to go. I will say that, yes, back to your question. So in internet society, we, we believe that the internet, as it were, should be open. And when I talk about the internet, you know I'm talking about the network of networks, which of course uh, uh, is the place where all these uh, most of these data are being generated. So we believe that internet should be open. And of course, we believe in what is known as digital right. Digital right in the sense that we believe that everybody has right to privacy. And of course, whatever data that I'm generating should be my data and nobody should, uh, you know, uh, if drop on me when I'm using the internet or when I'm using my phone. That is what we believe in. As a matter of fact, there is something we, uh, we, we uh, preach every year. And I think this is the month it is known as encryption. Encryption has to do with, okay, you know, end to end, uh, you know, uh, um, covering of your of your messages of your data in the way that uh, nobody can access your data nobody can listen to your data a very good example is when i'm using the whatsapp i want to ensure that what i'm transmitting to another person is only being received by that person and no other person and nobody should intercept it that is one of the things we believe in in the internet society and i'm so excited that we are discussing this and uh, for us, we also believe in what is known as rights, uh, you know, to be forgotten. If, if I say that, okay, fine, I have uh, done this online, and of course, I want it to be erased, and it should be erased. Nobody should go back to it and try to, to trace it, in as much as I've said that, okay, this has been forgotten, and I think it should be forgotten. So these are some of the values, these are some of the things that we believe in internet society, and we believe that the internet should be secured, and when it is secured, that means nobody, I mean, nobody can, uh, you know, have access to my data. The issue of privacy is personal. And we believe that uh, we should take it as that. And 
nobody should have access to my data once it is my data. So that is what we believe in internet society. We believe in encryption. We believe in privacy. We believe that, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, communications should be encrypted end to end. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you so much, uh, Colin, uh, for that very beautiful. I can assure you that your conversation with us online, we encrypted, encrypted it. So, uh, and I hope you understand that my own to you as well is also encrypted. Okay, so that just give absolutely, it that. Okay. absolutely. Uh, Honorable you. Sam George, in the last few days, the African Parliamentarians uh, Network Internet Governance, we have engaged a number of our counterparts from other continents. Uh, Earlier today, we met with some delegation from US. Yesterday, it was with European parliamentarians. And we discussed a number of cross-cutting issues, particularly because as Africa, we need to approach this issue of data privacy, data governance, um, with one voice. Could you like to share your perspective? What APNIG can do as an organization to ensure data governance and privacy not just in individual countries, but across Africa. Given the fact that some of our tech startups have operations across African uh, uh, countries. Honorable Sam George, please. Thank you very much, and then a very good afternoon to everyone. Um, APNIG, as you rightly stated, is African Parliamentary Network on Internet Governance. Um, it's about a year and a half old. We started in July last year in Malawi. Um, we're in Addis Ababa in December last year, and then Abuja about three weeks ago, and now we're in Kyoto. Basically, when we're discussing the subject of data governance, data sovereignty, cross-border data flows, we need to look at it within the context of the AU data policy framework, because the AU DPF is the overarching, um, let's call it the, 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 the overarching legislation or framework for the African continent. And if we use the AU DPF, then we now have to break it down to the regional levels and see what ECOWAS is doing through, um, uh, West Africa is doing through ECOWAS, what EALA is doing, what SADC is doing, and then we break it down to the individual countries. Now, we need to be careful not to be caught in, in the web of checkbox matrices because that's what's happening on the African continent. There's a lot of pressure from the European Union, from America, from other Western powers for our governments to tick check boxes. And so you have data protection legislation that's just been passed, but not been implemented. Because there's a difference between passing the legislation and, a diff and then there's, there's a whole different ball game implementing it. We have different levels of, of, of um, adaptation. In Ghana, for example, we, we passed our data protection law in 2000 and I think 2012. Yes, in 2012. We passed our data law in 2012. So we've had a data protection commission running for over 10 years. However, if you ask me if I'm comfortable with the implementation of data protection, I think that a lot more can be done. And Ghana is not unique. Nigeria just passed your data protection law and created the authority this year. Um, Egypt has had a data protection commission or authority for about four or five years. Or they've had a law for about four or five years, but no authority has been set up. So you realize that you can just do the check boxes. And when you attend this international conference, they say that we have legislation. But how is that legislation impacting the lives of your digital citizens? How is it enforcing the digital rights of your citizens? Is a completely different ball game. Now, for us as parliamentarians, one of the key things we need to begin to look at, and that as members of APNIG, is to ensure that portfolio ministries make available resources to data protection agencies and commissions and authorities, because it's extremely important. And that's, I'm gonna use the case study of Ghana, because we've done this for a bit longer than Nigeria has where you have a data protection commission that sits under our Ministry of Communications and Digitalization and gets its resources from government. And so what you then see is when data protection commissions or commissioners begin to impose or enforce their act on government agencies, the funding for those agencies get, for data protection gets reduced. 
because you're beginning to create a problem for government. Because you see the Data Protection Commission are fining government agencies because they're breaches of citizens' rights, because they're they are processing data without being properly accredited. All of this create issues for government, and, and they create governance issues. So the only way government is going, to hand, ha, ha, is going to handle this is either cut down your appropriation, or they bring the same level of appropriation, but as one thing being having your funds appropriated, is another thing having your funds disbursed. So they, you will see a huge appropriation for data protection, but the following year when you're doing a review of the, fi of the financials, you realize that only 10% of their appropriation was disbursed to them. And so you realize that in Ghana, for example, data protection is top notch in our capital cities. But once you step outside of the capital cities, what is the level of data protection? Okay. Outside of those capital cities, you see. So for us as APNIC, we think that members have to make sure that they, they, they oversight portfolio ministries and put the right pressure so that governments realize that data protection is a fundamental right. It's now become a fundamental right, like the rights of movement and the rights of free speech. And we must enforce this digital right by putting our money where our mouth is. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Sam Joy. With this intervention, the contest about who has better job rights is now settled. Um, uh, uh, so, um, but, but for the pop, for the pop, for the purpose of data, pro data privacy, for the purpose of data uh, privacy, I will comment for that on it. <laughs> Distinguished panelists, we've had a very wonderful time. Uh, I have just five minutes left, and I'm constrained. Online question. Okay. Can we have it very briefly? All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. So without wasting time, um, I will go into those questions that have been uh, dropped in the chat box. And the first one was asked by Mr. Musa Megeri. He asked, how can government or international community or private sector, sorry, I I'm reading verbatim. Um, I think we will pick out the, the, the context, but let me read verbatim. How can government or international community or private sector will continue to give more support and engagement for women in cybersecurity, professional and experts to contribute in cybersecurity strategic challenges and solutions at both the local and national level. So I, I think the question has to do with- With mainstream how, gender uh, into our data security and data privacy absolutely. Uh, uh, framework. Absolutely. So, absolutely. Uh, so uh, Dr. Judy uh, will answer that. Is there another question? Yes, the next question is from Mr. Benjamin Ebi Ikiba. He asked, why is the di digital rights of Nigerians not protected and who carries out these protections? So I think he wants to know about the implementation and enforcement of digital rights in Nigeria. Then Chinwil Buja made a comment. She said, cascading high level policy statement to the level of citizens access, understanding, Impact and ownership remains one of the major indices to check the practicability of these measures. So she, she's trying to uh, comment on how we are implementing the data, uh, you know, act in Nigeria. So these are the comments we have so far, so good online. And I believe that uh, others has. Oh, okay. So there, there is one other comment here from Timmy Ambali. He, he commented. He says. What is government doing? Sorry, this is a question, not a comment. What is government doing about harmonizing data to remove duplication? It has been pending for a long time. I think this is a very good question, and I'm sure that all the participants will be interested in the, knowing the answer to this question. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Over to you. Thank you so much, colleague. So I have five minutes left, and because uh, we are talking about compliance here, I'm also going to be very compliant with this, this timing. So I'm going to start with you. Uh, uh, you're going to answer the question, but I'm going to go sequentially now. So uh, you have your one minute, uh, Dr. Ewa. And once it's one minute, uh, Dr. Chidi will answer the question, and then I'll get back to this side, and then the Honorable here will, uh, will wrap it up. Okay, your 60 seconds start from now. Great. So a lot has been said, but um, uh, to summarize most of the comments that have been, been made, um, everybody is talking about how do we enhance how do we enhance um, data protection? You know, 
if there's no value to your data, if you cannot derive value from data, you will not see the need to protect it. All right. And so that speaks to how do we ensure that data subjects recognize the value to their, their data. All right. So, uh, and then the key question is what kind of data are we talking about? What kind of data can people derive value from? Um, governments across Africa, including Nigeria, so I'm just going to talk about, we'll mention about five new data sources which can bring immediate value to our economies if we exploit them. Right. One, of course, because we are talking about the internet and, and so on, social media data, social media big data can be, can be very useful, can be, can, if properly in the can that's, that's be a platform one. for they, creation. The next, the number two is mobile phone data. We have a very huge a, a population of people using mobile phones and so on. That data has very immense economic value, right? Number three is scanner data or transaction data. We all swipe as, uh, credit cards and debit cards and, and so on. Equally very valuable for economic planners and, and so on. Number four is automatic identification systems. This is data that is generated from sensors, put on unmanned systems, uh, area vehicles, and so highly useful for the, for the military and other intelligence, but particularly the Navy in, in protecting our waterways and even in, in combat. And the uh, last one? And the last one is uh, uh, geos geospatial or satellite data. So these new data sources can determine how we navigate towards being or becoming a data hub, uh, Africa being a data hub, and using that to, to, to grow the participation of our youth. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Thank Ewa, for, for, for letting us into these five sources. Uh, Dr. Chidi, your 60 seconds start from now. All right, Musa, thank you very much for your question. The simple answer is that the International Telecommunications Union, under the Digital Network and Society Department uh, Development, can help in upskilling women in terms of uh, cyber security. And now, in terms of your digital rights, let me just enumerate them yeah, very quickly. The right to assess data, right to ratify of error, right to the de de decision, delete your, er your, your message, right to restrict processing, right to data portability, right to withdraw consent, right to object to marketing, right to inform, be informed of the existence of automatic systems. But these things are governed within a specific uh, principles, which means that there must be transparency, there must be explicit privacy policy stating what the data should be used for, and no implied consent and no bundled consent. And now, to help do justice to this, um, there are a set of you know, regulatory tools or instruments, like the Consumer Code of Practice Regulation of NCC 2007, the, um, the registration of telephone subscribers' data from NCC, the lawful intercept from NCC, the guidelines on management of personal data and a host of orders. Data and a host of orders. Thank you so, so much. Thank you very much. Um, I hope we'll be able to meet you in Abuja. Thank, th thank <laughs> Dr. James Olufuye, in 30 seconds, can you wrap up your thought for us? In 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, all this uh, means that we're working on digitalization. Uh, that means we need to enable API uh, for effective data harmonization. Yeah, we note the Ministry of Internal Affairs doing something about this, so they need to accelerate the process. Cyber security is very important. I uh, need to let us know that uh, private sector does a form of self-control, and uh, we know if you can't control anything, you can't manage it. So government need to uh, speed up the issue of uh, compliance, prosecution, and uh, management. And then, as we do all this, we should have the African continental free trade zone in mind, because we need to uh, enable uh, private sector to unleash their potential in that big African market of more than 1.3 billion people. Okay. And finally, sign and ratify the Malabo Convention, talking to our senator and the House of Rep now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Honorable uh, uh, Stanley, uh, the, the, gavel, the gavel is on, so you have 30 seconds if I put the gavel down. <laughs> well, first of all, I want to thank everybody uh, for all their contribution. Uh, you can see that uh, data have a lot of versatility uh, dep depending on where the source of the data is. So scrubbing, data staging is also going to be part of our lawmaking, and uh, we are hoping that we're going to make a lot of progress in no time. Thank you very much. On this very beautiful note, I'd like to thank all the panelists, from the lead presenter to the panelists. And I must also acknowledge uh, our team from Nigeria, including our colleagues from the Nigerian Communication Commission. And I must recognize Madam. Internet herself, Mrs. Uh, 
Mary Uduma, for the wonderful job you have done today together. Till we meet again next time, keep the flag flying. This is Nigeria. Have a wonderful evening.